for just one more minute, Swen, and then we'll get started. Okay, I think we can get started. I'm sure others will come in. So uh, Heather and Lisa, if you can just keep an eye on the, the waiting room, we'll let others in as they come. I'm just gonna stop sharing the title card here. So just before we get going, I'm going to throw a URL for a virtual exhibit that will be referenced uh, in this in the talk. So, um, without further ado, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Herndon. I am a university archivist and an associate university librarian at Queen's University. It is my great honor to welcome everyone to the 39th Annual Archives Lecture, which will be delivered by Sven Steinberg. This will be our second virtual annual archives lecture. Although last year I, I did host from home, so I feel my presence here on campus in my office is a sign that next year we will be able to return to our regular in-person event on campus while still being able to connect to a wider audience through virtual means as well. Uh, a few housekeeping items before we get going. The lecture uh, is recorded and will be shared afterwards on the Queen's University Library's YouTube site. Uh, we have several of the last few years of the annual archives lecture. So if you want to have a look at that and see some of the things that we've uh, done with past speakers, you're more than welcome to. Uh, Zoom is set up so that guests are muted automatically. So you should not be able to turn on your microphones accidentally. And I would ask if you could please keep your cameras off too. I would encourage you to use the reaction buttons uh, during the talk or at the end of the talk. Uh, there will be a question and answer session after the lecture. And if you could please type any questions that you have in chat and, and I and the archive staff will uh, convey them to Dr. Steinberg so he can focus on answering uh, the questions rather than having to, to puzzle through the chat. So to begin, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, here at Queen's, we're on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory, and I am grateful to live as an uninvited guest upon the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Nation. And I'd also like to acknowledge that uh, you are joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. I have a few Introductory remarks concerning the archives itself, this lecture series and our speaker. Uh, the Queen's University Archives has a special twofold mandate. It undertakes its activities in order to manage, preserve, conserve, and make accessible the information assets of the university, to maintain an authentic record of the programs, people, and operations of the university, and to provide archival management and conservation for culturally significant records of external organizations and individuals in support of teaching, research, and service at Queen's University. And Queen's actually received its first archival document way back in 1869. And today the archives houses uh, approximately 10 kilometers of textual records, 2 million photographs, tens of thousands of architectural plans and drawings, and thousands of sound recordings and moving images. And the archives is really quite privileged to hold the records of regionally nationally and internationally significant individuals and organizations from the entire range of scholarly disciplines and occupations, including the historical records for the city of Kingston and the county of Frontenac, which speaks to the enduring town and gown relationship between the university and the communities it serves. 
Now, the annual archives lecture is a special event in the academic year for the Library and Archives. It highlights the archival collections that are held by Queen's University, and it really serves as a public forum to disseminate and discuss the research that is or has been conducted using those collections. And this year's lecture is in part the culmination of over two years of work that started uh, with a conversation in the archives reading room and resulted in the Queen's Refuge, uh, Refugees in the University Virtual and Physical Exhibits. And again, I've put that URL in the chat if you want to bookmark that or have a look at that afterwards. So I'd like to now introduce you to Dr. Sven Steinberg, who at the end of 2019 initiated the exhibition project, which included our public services and private records archivist, Heather Holm, uh, Queen's University students, Nicholas Kinghill, Aaron Levitt and Megan Zell, and our curator for rare books and special collections, uh, Dr. Brendan Edwards. Swen is a historian and lecturer in the Migration and Diaspora Studies program at Carleton University and the Department of History at Queen's University. As postdoctoral researcher, Swen is affiliated with the German Historical Institute in Washington, DC, and his Pacific Regional Office at uh, UC Berkeley. He also serves as a research ambassador of the German Academic Exchange Service. And early in 2019, Swen joined the advisory committee of the Austrian Archive for Exile Studies and the Exile Library in Vienna. He is the editor of the blog Migrant Knowledge and organizer of the Migrant Knowledge Network. He is also a board member of the German Studies Collaboratory. Swen's most recent uh, interests are located at the intersection of migration and knowledge, refugees from Nazi Germany and Nazi occupied Europe, and especially unaccompanied minors. His most recent articles include on Austrian refugee children, agency experience and knowledge in Ernst Papenek's preliminary study from 1943 in the Journal of Austrian American History, and knowledge from five continents, escape destinations in the publications of German speaking political refugees, 1933 to 40, in mediations through exile, cultural translation and knowledge transfer on alternative routes of escape from Nazi terror. In 2020, he published the special issue Refugees from Nazi Occupied Europe to British Overseas Territories in the Yearbook of the Research Center for German and Austrian Exile Studies. Ongoing workshop series that Swen organized include In Search uh, for the Migrant Child, Global Histories of Youth and Migration Between Knowledge, Experience, and Everyday Life, Jewish Refugees in Global Transit, Spaces, Temporalities, Interactions, both organized for the German Historical Institute in Washington, and Provocation and Challenge, Populism and Neo-Fascism from a trans Transatlantic Perspective. And this was organized for the German Embassy in Ottawa and the Canadian Heritage Digital Citizen Initiative. Today, Swen's lecture topic will be Queen's Refuge, Thoughts about an Exhibition Project and Refugee Research from a Historical Perspective. Swen, once again, welcome. The virtual floor is yours. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much for uh, the invitation. I try to share my screen. Yeah, now it works. Um, thank you very much uh, for uh, this kind of introduction, Ken, and for the for the invitation. I'm very much honored to be uh, part of this um, uh, annual lecture series and uh, to present a project um, that is a collaboration uh, between, yeah, some of you, between Queen's Archives, uh, the Jordan Library, uh, and, and other institutions that are connected to Queen's. And I will talk about this uh, later on. But again, I'm, I'm pretty much honored and I'm happy that um, I have uh, the opportunity to present or to talk about this exhibition project and um, some broader perspectives. Um, uh, on uh, refugee history. So um, again, the uh, occasion, uh, as Ken already mentioned, um, uh, of this uh, uh, lecture is a specific project, um, the exhibition Queen's Refuge, Refugees, um, uh, and the, the university I will introduce to you um, uh, in, in the main part of my uh, talk, um, connected to some uh, aspects uh, or broader um, context of uh, refugee movements and refugee re research I see in there. And um, in general, this comes with uh, two aspects, or at least perspectives. Um, first, migration research from a historical perspective, um, including research on uh, refugees and forced migrants. 
And second, the local representation of uh, global phenomena in modern migration history. And this is um, the structure of my lecture today related to a much uh, recent debate about uh, refugee agency um, within larger refugee movements, uh, frameworks or policies. In short, the question where we can identify the individual in hers or his story and what this individual story means for a broader context, for the representation of refugees at that time in history and for our understanding of processes of forced migration today, including the terminology that we use to describe processes, but also individuals, or the historic, uh, historicity um, of a terminology we can discover today in legislation and public debates on newspapers. But um, let me start with one of these his stories um, here at Queen's. So, um, this is a lecture series, a well-documented one, of course. Uh, so I uh, had a look in, on the website, uh, who else was invited um, before me, um, because this is number 39. And um, I discovered, um, among others, uh, John Meisel, um, who gave a talk in 2000 about archives in cyberspace, etc. Um, so that was the title of the talk. And um, probably some of you will not know who, who John Meisel was. Um, and this is something I, I wouldn't recommend <laughs> to my students, but of course I Googled him. And um, what you can learn from his uh, um, entry on Wikipedia is that Meisel was born in Vienna, Austria in October uh, 1923 and moved to Canada in 1942. And then you uh, will find a couple of um, uh, more information about uh, his professional career. Uh, he, so in fact, Meisel came to Queens um, in 1949. He was a pioneer in research on political behavior in, uh, in Canada. And he left his home in uh, Czechoslovakia, actually, uh, in 1937 for a, uh, for a further education in Britain. So um, this is not so much refugee history. And uh, the uh, uh, description that he moved to Canada in 1942 is uh, also not so much pointing to uh, a forced migration context. Um, in Meisel's case, uh, we know a little bit more uh, because he published um, uh, his memoirs. Um, and uh, in these memoirs, you will discover a subchapter called A Long Journey. Um, because Meisel uh, stranded in 1940 in Casablanca uh, and was forced to leave uh, the upcoming um, uh, Second World War and the uh, uh, World War Theater in the, in, in the Mediterranean via Haiti. And then uh, he managed to arrive here in Canada and he ended up in Batawa, close to Kingston, a uh, yeah, a town that was founded by a Czechoslovakian um, entrepreneur, refugee, who brought over not only his, uh, uh, his factory, but um, his entire workers. So there is, um, there are a lot of hidden uh, stories um, behind terminology, and I will talk about this um, in the first part uh, of this, of this lecture. Uh, so I will to a certain extent, I will turn around uh, the title. I will start with uh, of my lecture. I will start with migration research and um, uh, refugees uh, in general. So um, according to Christiane Hartzig and Dirk Herder and Leo Lukas and many others, um, research about migration began uh, in the 1880s, um, especially in Europe and North America, uh, focused on assimilation in the US in the 1920s and 50s. In addition, from the beginning in the uh, 1880s to the 1930s, a broad range of data collection and uh, theorizing emerged. It was often connected to uh, ethical and uh, social welfare issues or to population uh, planning uh, policies. This resulted in two problems. First, these investigations were initially only interested in emigration and immigration. Important uh, migration movements thus remained hidden people only migrated from one society or state to another. Second, the data collections point to a source problem. After all, these studies often use census data, 
As a result, entire groups remained invisible, uh, invisible, such as women, children, or slaves, as well as temporary migrants, such as commuters. In general, these studies did not look at the temporalities of migration, which could sometimes take months or even years, and which does not always go from one place to another, from a starting to an end point. And John Meisel's biography is a very good example to show this. One of the key representatives was um, Ernest uh, George Ravenstein, an English geographer. In uh, 1885 and uh, 1889, he published his Laws of Migration, in which he certainly focused on women. However, he was more interested in contemporary issues and the situation in Britain. He found out that migration takes place mainly in short distances and to urban centers, and that the population in cities is less mobile. For a long time, only the North Atlantic 19th century so-called proletarian mass migration from Europe outward received most attention. Parallel contract migration of non-white workers from Asia to the factories in the fields um, of the plantation belt were neglected. In the 1960s, new approaches expanded the field and sophisticated interdisciplinary migration studies emerged, focusing, for example, on slavery or on refugees. The distinction between free and non-free migration became more and more important and made new migration phenomena visible. But with few exceptions, migration research remained a European and North American field until, until the 1970s, and it was limited to long distance migrations. Three major new approaches have been uh, developed in the late uh, 1970s and 80s on the macro level, the world system theory, on the meso level, the labor market theory, and on the micro level, the study of family economies and the new economics of labor migration. Since the 1990s, research methodologies and uh, theorizations have been further refined by analysis of um, uh, st structurating and uh, habitus of human capital and uh, funds of knowledge. So the intersection of migration and knowledge came into play, um, social capital and uh, strategic competence, network theory, mental maps, diaspora, and scapes of migration. The role of uh, states in um, establishing migration uh, regimes has also received a new emphasis since the 1990s and this aspects um, this aspect had been neglected as long as research focused on uh, 19th century um, transatlantic migrations in which um, states hardly interfered while um, forced labor regimes were established um, in the non-white world. From the 1970s on, a reconceptualization of uh, research on human mobility began, which stressed that the approach to migration needed to include all types of mobility, differ uh, differentiated by specific characteristics, and that um, the compartmentalization of research by type of migration, so slavery, under indenture, free, refugee, needed to be overcome. I will come back to this point in a minute because this leads us um, to important terms um, to distinct between migrants, but I will try to make clear why the distinction between free and non-free migration is sometimes misleading. The distinction of free and slave migrations in particular was held to have uh, um, racializing implications when slave equals African. Um, as well as deprived of agency, forced migrated black people appear as passive, while at the same time the equating of free migration with Europe and voluntarily um, departure decisions endows white migrants with agency. A frame of passive Africans and active Europeans is uh, constructed. In addition, the assumption that European migrant men and women make free decisions overlooks the economic considerations. They departed on, uh, under often extreme constraints. The choice between lifelong undernourishment and food on the table at the cost of massive cultural change is less than free. In a nutshell, we need to use terminologies carefully and sensitively 
um, so as not to hurt those uh, whose life we investigate. Careful, especially because of questions of agency and identity um, mentioned here. And I will underline the, the, the aspect of terminology by two um, identity related examples um, that are directly linked to our topic today, to refugees. So Bertolt Brecht, for example, a left socialist communist writer in, um, inter and intellectual who um, had escaped from Nazi Germany, wrote in 1939 in Denmark um, the short poem concerning the label emigrant. You can see the first part of the poem here. Um, so how does he describe his situation and what terms does he use? I always found the name false, which they gave us, emigrants. That, meant, that means um, those who leave their country, but we did not leave of our own free will, choosing another land, nor did we enter into a land to stay there, if possible, forever. Merely, we fled. We are driven out, banned, not a home, but an exile, shall the land be that took us in. Refugee, um, uh, refugees uh, are uh, specific um, uh, migrants, of course, but what Brecht criticized here was not less um, than the advice formulated before, to be careful with terminology. I have another example from the same group of refugees or from at least the same time. Most of these refugees from uh, German and then later on Nazi occupied Europe um, were Jews. Um, and these two terms were used at the time by state agencies or relief organizations. But um, such a compartmentalization comes very often to its limits when we ask the, the actors it's, uh, themselves. Most of them did not uh, uh, feel like Brecht. Um, they did not want to be Germans anymore. And most of them did not want to go back to Germany, Poland or other countries in Central Europe after the Second World War. On the other hand, many of them had Jewish ancestors, but lived secular, secular non-religious lives. When the Nazis seized power by force, they made them Jews again. So can we call them German Jewish refugees or all of them? Let's come back to my main point in this uh, part um, of the lecture and um, the already formulated finding that migration needs to include all types of mobility following Christiane Harzig and Dirk Hörder, a typology of migration, um, which needs gendering um, in uh, each empirical uh, application, would thus include uh, free migrants, um, so people who decide uh, when to depart and where to go according, according to their own desires and uh, life projects within the frame, uh, uh, frame states impose on out and in migration. Um, another form of migration uh, are uh, self filled labor migrants, whether of the 19th century proletarian mass migrations or of the 20th century former colony um, to former colonizer states. So um, this is a migration direction that goes north, uh, south to north, um, who decide to depart under um, partly severe economic constraints. Bound labor migrants are um, another um, form or um, coming with another uh, decision-making process uh, for migration. Um, they have to sell their labor for a, a number of years because of, uh, of poverty. Um, we can see this, for example, in uh, Europe's 18th century um, uh, indentured uh, servants, um, Asian indentured workers uh, under imperialism, um, the self-built credit ticket migrants um, who worked off the loan for their, their passage. This is something we can find, for example, in North America. Then we have uh, forced labor migrants. Um, those are people who are enslaved for work uh, for life. So um, African uh, slaves, for example, in the Atlantic world, um, who share um, or who are enslaved for service um, or intellectual labor. Um, people from Africa, for example, in the Indian Ocean world uh, and uh, people elsewhere are um, examples here. And um, forced labor migrants uh, are also people who are bound for a certain period uh, of their life against their will. Um, so this is, um, for example, South, South Africa under apartheid 
or who are kidnapped and placed in labor camps for an uh, undeterminated um, period. Um, this is what you can see in Nazi Germany and then later in Nazi occupied Europe, but also in Imperial Japan um, or in uh, the Stalinist um, Soviet, U uh, Soviet Union. Another distinction, according to Hartzig and Hörder, um, are involuntarily uh, migrants. Um, those are people who are displaced by political intolerance, uh, religious intolerance, um, or other courses like ethnic or gender-based inequalities. Um, they um, also differentiate uh, refugees. Um, in their terminology, um, those are people um, uh, that are fleeing from war and other violence. And finally, uh, they um, compare also um, displaced persons. Um, those are people um, that are uh, mobile or um, that are migrating um, because of ecological disasters, whether natural or man-made. This typology uh, reminds us of the meaning um, of land, uh, language, the terminology we use to describe forced migrants, and the terminology that refugee, uh, refugees used to describe themselves, including the temporal perspective. These uh, terminologies change during migration, in transit situations, and during or after arrival, whatever arrival means. This was crucial also for the project I'm talking about today and um, challenging for the entire um, exhibition team. Refugee, for example, is a rather modern term established um, in the interwar period as a legal category, uh, category under the umbrella of the League of Nations, international recognized since 1951 at the latest in the United Nations Refugee Convention, but often not rec recognized by individual states or um, differently recognized. So, and Canada is one example of this recognition. I think this is a good point to move on to the second part of my lecture to the um, specific locality um, of global refugee movements, um, the exhibition uh, project Queen's Refuge Refugees and the University tries to present on a very exemplary and biographically um, basis. One individual refugee represented by one object um, tells the individual story and a global story of refugees related to Queen's history. And this is coming with aspects you already know uh, from the previous part of my lecture. This is about individual refugees and refugee movements, but this is also about the response to forced migration and to all opposing as aspects uh, related to them, to rejection and, of course, the representation of immigration laws um, on a local level. So um, Ken already mentioned uh, this, um, the project uh, has its, its own history as always. So I started um, preparing this uh, already at the end of 2018 and uh, had a home uh, from the university archive was my first contact um, with this project. And um, yeah, she became a wonderful partner um, in this project and uh, co-curator. Um, so um, the, the, the biggest difficulty is um, or has been there is no uh, refugee history at Queens uh, that somebody had already written. So um, it was um, research from scratch. Um, so we had literally to, to look out for uh, those individual um, uh, persons and biographies, but also to the responses of the university uh, 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 of the university of the of the wider community. From the very beginning on, I, I wanted it to, to be a project that includes students and had made this possible. Um, so uh, we could um, bring in um, uh, Aaron Levitt, Nicholas Kinghill, and uh, Megan Seller, uh, who worked with us together, and us, uh, this includes also Brendan Edwards, who was mentioned uh, previously. So um, a team of uh, an archivist and historian and librarian students, uh, a very pretty much wonderful project. And yeah, it was supposed to be opened in uh, fall 2020. And then COVID hit and every, every, everything got uh, derailed. Um, it was supposed to um, uh, be opened uh, together with an international conference I organized, um, Environments of Exiles, 
um, exile, uh, refugees, nature, and uh, uh, representation. So we had to postpone everything. Um, and we could open uh, uh, the exhibition finally in uh, September uh, this year. So this is, um, in short, the background or the history of this endeavor and also uh, of this talk. And if you are in Kingston, uh, you have the opportunity to visit um, the uh, ex exhibition um, Queen's Refuge Refugees and the University at the Jordan Library, um, but please do so in the next um, days. The exhibition is open until Friday uh, this week, um, but our content um, is mirrored on a website and therefore hopefully um, preserved for um, further research. So what is this um, exhibition all about? This exhibition um, uh, Queen's Refuge, Examines, um, Stories of Forced Migration um, in the history of Queen's University and within the Queen's community. Um, it reflects the diverse uh, trajectories um, of those who sought refuge. Some found sanctuary at Queen's and in Kingston, uh, and Kingston became their new home. Others found safety at the university for only a short time migrating elsewhere when the opportunity was available. In addition to examples of shelter, relief and solidarity, the exhibition presents instances of uh, reluctance, prejudice, anti-Semitism and racism. So Queen's Re uh, Re Refuge, uh, Refugees in the, um, and the University tells um, its story through the lens of individual biographies. This is what I've mentioned before, one person associated with one refugee related phenomena is further represented by one object. Um, these are stories that go um, beyond campus and have always been closely linked to the broader Kingston community and it, it is a story um, that is still um, highly relevant um, today. Following uh, the opening question, and I will talk about this uh, later on a bit more in detail, and uh, I, will, I brought you some examples um, uh, from this section. So following our opening question, what's in the suitcase, the exhibition presents perspectives um, from uh, and on refugees by focusing on four aspects of refugee, of the refugee experience, um, we formulated directions, transit, relief, and arrival. And um, again, I will talk about these per perspectives uh, bit more in a minute with some individual examples and the exhibition closes with the question what's a refuge which we encourage uh, visitors to reflect upon. Again this is a, um, a collective endeavor, uh, a collective project and, and product, so I will mention again uh, briefly the, the exhibition team. Um, so this was curated by Brendan Atwas, um, Heather Holm, Megan Seller, Nicholas Kinghel, Aaron Levitt and me. And um, to a certain extent, this exhibition also represents the, the interests of uh, these individuals, while at the same time, um, the exhibition reflects notable silences in collections, the archival records, uh, research representation, um, representations and even common knowledge. And um, I will uh, give you now a short, uh, let's say virtual tour, uh, a tour that presents again, the results of this collaboration, uh, collaborative project covering the late 19th century um, until today and uh, representing all status groups of the university. Um, so from students um, to staff to professors uh, in about 30, roughly 30 examples. So it starts with uh, the question, what's in a suitcase? Um, so forced migration is not simply um, about a point of departure or the place of arrival. Most refugees um, suffer traumatic and uh, repeated dislocations, um, challenges that degrade their social, economic and political status and even their physical and mental health. And no matter how much the refugee might hope or try to make decisions about their destination, the choices available are often very limited. Advice and resettlement assistance must typically be accepted from others. Um, be they individuals, religious communities, state agencies, or international organizations. This um, suitcase um, 
which is the main object of uh, of our um, of our exhibition coming with this specific question, what's in the suitcase? The suitcase belonged to uh, Maria and uh, Danilo Lushiuk, um, Ukrainian displaced persons. And um, Maria Lushiuk was um, also a former forced labor migrant uh, brought to Nazi Germany. And um, they were aided by the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation um, Administration and later the International Refugee uh, Organization. After years of uh, privy, uh, privation and uncertainty, they left uh, Warton Europe in 1949 and found asylum here in Kingston. Here, they built their lives as uh, Canadians and their children both attended Queen's University and later helped other refugees, never forgetting what their parents endured and what the suitcase all that both of them, Maria and Danilo uh, Luciuk, uh, had when they came into the city represents. The second part of the exhibition um, is entitled um, di uh, Directions, and um, yeah, this points us again to this kind of terminology um, we are dealing with. So terms like departure or destination um, reduce very often complexity, especially for refugees. Orientation and uh, reorientation were, were more common even for those helping refugees and uh, organizing relief. Um, we started uh, this uh, part uh, with the street sign. Uh, so Union Street, uh, one of the, so, and again, we, we are reflecting about the term directions in uh, relation to forced, uh, aspects of forced migration and refugees in Queen's history. So Union Street, um, one of the main streets on campus um, outside the Douglas Library was uh, presumably named in commemoration of the Union Act of uh, 1840 that united Lower and Upper Canada into uh, one province of Canada after rebellions for democratic reform in the late 1930s. Shortly after 1941, Queen's University was founded. This is where our story at least starts um, with the artificial settler colonial geographies, which our campus represents um, in the present day and with the forced migration of uh, indigenous people who lived in these territories long before settlers, loyalists and other newcomers arrived. Therefore, um, the uh, aerial uh, photograph from 1919, you can see here on the slide is uh, misleading. You can see Union Street and an empty space where Douglas Library and the Queen's Refuge uh, exhibition is located now. But this place was not a terra nullius. Our exhibition is located on the traditional land of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people, and we are grateful to be guests on these lands um, with a long history, a history that is directly linked to refugees and forced migration in very different contexts. Another example for this different uh, directions we discovered during our research for um, uh, this exhibition project um, and related to forced migration um, uh, and Queen's history, um, it's Ernest uh, Cockburn Kite. Um, he was born in, in Cardiff, Wales, and uh, began working as a libra librarian when he was 18. Uh, upon moving to Canada in 1927, uh, he held the position of chief librarian of Queen's University for about 20 years. He was also a co-founder of the uh, Bibliographical Society of Canada. In the First World War and uh, from 1914 to 1919, Kite served in the British Army as a musketry officer in a uh, divisional wing battalion uh, of the infantry in France. His papers at the Queen's University archives contain numerous short stories, um, including the unpublished manu manuscript No Refugee and No Refuge for Refugees. He wrote this short story after the outbreak of the Second World War and depicted refugees in France fleeing the German attack in 1940. While this story was fictional, Kite was confronted with such refugee groups when he was a soldier in France um, in the First World War. About 8% of the Belgian, Belgium population fled their country after the German attack 
and until uh, November 1918, some 320,000 uh, of them relocated to France. Kite remembered them in the new situation of another war and another people in need. The No Refuge for Refugees uh, short story mirrors his geographical and experiential knowledge from World War I, also his sensibility for the humane perspective of refugees as individuals. The refugees during the First World War refer to Kite's later domain and to Queen's University, where relief efforts for Belgian refugees had been organized in the fall of 1914 by the Belgium Relief Committee and other groups. In November 1915, for example, the Theological Alumni, uh, Alumni Association organized a concert with Belgian artists at Grand Hall for the, uh, and I quote, by Belgium uh, sufferers. Later in the war, money was collected by the Queen's War Relief uh, Fund and distributed to relief organizations supporting refugees from the Armenian genocide or uh, Serbia and also to people from Bel Belgium. And um, a third example for this kind of directions um, Queens is um, related to or, or linked to when it comes to uh, refugees um, I brought for this talk is Arthur Zielinski Arthur. So he was born in Lithuania, um, a country uh, occupied by the Soviet Union um, in June 1914, uh, 1940, when he was 13. He was imprisoned after the German occupation in uh, summer uh, 1941 and brought to France as a forced laborer. Uh, assisted by the French resistance, he escaped to Britain, joined the Polish armed forces in the West, and in 2020, his daughter-in-law published um, the novel Against My Will, Lithuania, to freedom, telling the story of an odyssey throughout uh, Europe and beyond. After the war, Arthur studied commerce, economics, and business administration in Scotland, earning a BSc in 1915. Until 1957, he worked as an accountant for the soda company Speppes before starting a very successful university career in psychology. After further studies, he earned his PhD at the, uni uh, at the Institute for Psy uh, Psychiatry uh, of the University of London in 1963. Uh, uh, Until 1965, he worked at the University of Canterbury um, in Christchurch, New Zealand, where he introduced a training program for clinical psychology. And in the same year, he became director of the graduate program in clin uh, clinical um, psychology here at Queen's University and professor of psychology in January 1966. He died in May 1990, shortly after his retirement. So Arthur's biography um, reminds us um, in particular that the connection between forced migration and the university does not lead to a straight and foreseeable path or direction. His research was dedicated to um, psychological techniques of decision making and the impact of uh, stress. And in October um, 1989, a few months before his death, um, he was quoted in the Queen's Journal about a student stress to a certain extent one of his answers also referred to the relationship between his own experiences as a refugee and his research in, uh, research stating that i quote him the past relationships and survival were more important but since world world war ii people have the opportunity to succeed and it makes them work harder today's lifestyle is much more stressful End of quote. This is, of course, a large commitment when you think about his biography and um, uh, this going back and forth of uh, his forced migration. But it is also um, a reminder um, uh, on the complexity, um, the topic of migration and forced migration come with, comes with a complexity often hidden um, in documents we find uh, hidden behind uh, terms, even the terminology uh, former refugees use um, use themselves to describe them in a specific stage. The next section, uh, and I brought you two uh, more examples from this section, um, uh, we called transit. Um, so for some uh, refugees, Queen's University uh, was not a point of arrival. Uh, when they had the choice or opportunity to move on, they decided to leave. Others were forced to come back to Kingston and left when it was possible. 
Um, one of um, the examples uh, we have in this uh, section is um, Annie uh, uh, Gordon. Uh, she was born in uh, Williamsburg, uh, Williamsburg, Ontario, and worked as a teacher before starting her studies um, at Queen's University. She graduated in 1897 in arts and continued as a um, uh, school teaching. But in 1901, she joined the American Congressional Board of Foreign Missions and the Central Girls College in Marash in um, the Ottoman Empire, where she taught mathematics. In September 1922, uh, Annie Gordon fled to Athens after the Greco Turkish War, organizing refugee relief work uh, following the violence against um, uh, ethnic minorities and the population uh, exchange in the Treaty of Lausanne from 1923. Annie Gordon remained in Athens until September 1924, um, occupied um, how she described it herself, occupied with refugee work in Greece. She briefly returned to Smyrna in May 1924 um, and taught at the junior college uh, in Athens until 1931. After retirement, she lived in Ottawa. In April 1950, uh, Gordon donated this and other dolls um, that she likely brought to Canada to the Agnes Etherington Art Center. Gordon was both um, a refugee and a witness of forced migration uh, following the uh, Armenian genocide in 1915 and other violence against minoritized people in this region. At the same time, her work was recognized in the uh, Queen's Journal and the alumni news uh, uh, at the university throughout the 1920s and 30s, underlining the Christian implication of her teaching and relief work. Similar to the Belgian refugees, um, after 1914, people at Queen's advocated for persecuted minorities before the First World War. Um, but according to Canadian immigration law, this advocacy was exclusively and only focused on uh, specific refugee groups fitting familiar cultural and um, even racial patterns. Um, the second uh, example I brought to you is Thomas Fahidi. Um, so during the Hungarian uh, revolution of 1956, so and he's also another example for a person related to um, a forced migration context, but being kind of in transit, in an in transit situation. So during the Hungarian revo uh, revolution in 1956, over um, uh, 3,000 university and college students uh, left Hungary uh, permanently to continue their studies abroad and to seek um, safety and opportunities. Students uh, left due um, to the Soviet imposed policies which targeted um, educated citizens in particular, leaving them with little freedom in employment and uh, voting rights um, if they opposed the government. Many went to uh, Vienna after the uprising in 1956, um, where they were su uh, supported by fundraising efforts um, by both Queen's students and the World uh, University Service of Canada. Uh, about 400 students boarded government-sponsored flights uh, with more than about 100 uh, arriving independently. The students initially uh, resided in an uh, immigration center near McGill University. Um, the center provided uh, transition um, education classes, language courses, academic um, uh, orientation, and an introduction to Canadian culture. There were attempts to make um, the work program as equal um, opportunity as possible, as students were uh, required to find work in Canada as part of their transition. Initially, um, Queen's University was only going to take in four of these students, but after fundraising support and a bursary created by um, the Atkinson Foundation, the university brought in 12 um, Hungarian students. The scholarships depended on if they did good work um, as Canada was looking for skilled workers in refugee uh, students at the time. This is reflected in how the most successful students um, were in engineering due to um, the support they got there. The student uh, featured in our exhibition, Timus Fahidi, was a student in chemistry until 1961 and at the top of his class, therefore, he had scholarship opportunities. The success was based 
on how well students like Fahidi did in the English, English courses run by Queens during the summer as represented by this travel sized Hungarian English dictionary from 1956 from um, the Queens libraries. And of course, the ability to balance school with work. Financial hardship was also a factor influencing the student's success. These factors alongside the stress of displacement um, and transition likely explain why two of the 12 uh, students from Hungary dropped out of their studies at Queen's, pointing to the importance of adequate support in determining refugee student access. This was also true for Fahidi, who after his PhD in 1965 became a professor in uh, chemical engineering at the University um, of Waterloo in Ontario. Transit is a good um, keyword um, to point uh, into another direction uh, away from our main exhibition, because um, you might have heard um, the uh, pump house here in uh, Kingston hosts the traveling exhibition uh, Refuge Canada, a traveling exhibition coming from um, the Canadian Museum of uh, Immigration Pier 21 in Halifax. And uh, we were in contact very soon uh, or very early on uh, already in 2019. And um, within this uh, traveling uh, exhibition Refuge Canada, we got the opportunity to create um, an own exhibition space. Uh, we got uh, this very huge um, showcase and um, the exhibition team decided to take this opportunity also um, to make some um, advertisement for, for our own exhibition at Jordan Library. And uh, we created this um, exhibition space, this showcase under a specific focus um, uh, we entitled uh, internment and alternative routes from Nazi um, persecution. So Kingston and Queen's University um, were no major destinations for refugees from Nazi persecution in the, in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and this persecution took um, place first in Germany and later all over Europe. Immigration restrictions and, and prejudices on the one hand and the lack of opportunities to cross the Atlantic Ocean on the other were the main reasons. Nevertheless, people in Kingston and at the university began to advocate for um, these refugees. The largest group of refugees were those interned as enemy aliens in Britain after the outbreak of World War II and deported to Canada in 1940, um, among them uh, about uh, 2,000 Jewish refugees from Germany or Austria. Only um, 235 were granted um, study releases uh, from the Canadian uh, internment camps until the end of 1943. Some of them were accepted at Queen's University uh, as students. And a few, uh, but in addition, um, there are a few additional refugee scholars that found refuge at the university based on belief efforts of individuals, um, groups, or organizations. Um, they organized a travel accommodation fellowships and a new beginning in Kingston. Other refugees arrived only after um, the war uh, when immigration restrictions were lifted. The refugee routes to Queens varied um, individually throughout the 1930s and 40s. The refugee biographies we present in the pump house um, are connected to various aspects, solidarity and rejection at the same time um, since anti-Semitism was still an issue at Queen's University in the 1940s, to integration into the community on different levels and onward migration when the war is, uh, was over, and to relief efforts um, for other refugees after 1945. And I brought you two examples from this perspectives, um, uh, perspective on refugees in Queen's history um, to this section as well. Um, the first one is Alfred Bader. Um, he was born in Vienna in uh, 1938. Many of you will know him, of course. Um, in 1938, he was no longer allowed to attend school because um, of uh, the newly introduced uh, anti-Semitic laws um, in um, in Austria after the so-called Anschluss, and um, he was sent to Britain with a kindertransport um, the same year, interned in 1940 as an enemy alien and deported to Canada um, with other refugees um, and uh, his shirt uh, from Camp One uh, in Quebec 
um, documents his internment in Canada. So the red dot was initially on the outside to um, identify uh, escaped prisoners and Beta later turned this backside of the shirt um, outside in, uh, which is a fascinating um, um, uh, aspect in this in this fascinating object here uh, telling us also somebody something about um, identity related aspects and um, uh, other perspectives. Beta was released then from internment after 15 months and accepted at Queen's University and in January 1943 uh, 17 other formerly interned students studied in Kingston, so most of them supported by the scholarship fund for refugee students and organizations organizations on campus. At Queen's University, Bader became a part of the student community and was involved in the newly funded first uh, Hillel House on a uh, Canadian campu campus um, as a center for Jewish student, uh, students. Um, he earned his bachelor and master in chemistry and a bachelor in history, followed by his PhD in organic um, uh, chemistry at Harvard University in 1915. So, Beta after that, um, so he's kind of also an example for this transit situation. Um, in his case, um, first this in-betweenness and uncertainty um, of the future, and then this future perspectives that were uh, developed here at Queen's University and uh, are related to his onward migration, making Queen's University a transit point for him in his individual biography. And um, he later on became, as you all know, a very successful businessman in the US, an art collector, and of course, a generous donor um, to Queen's University. The second example I brought you is um, um, uh, Christina Spiranska, um, who took a different road at the time. Again, we are in the, uh, still in the pump house and um, we are talking about internment and alternative routes from Nazi persecution. So uh, uh, Christina uh, Spiranska was born in Krakow um, in Poland and a graduate um, uh, in uh, literature and language studies from uh, Krakow uh, University. Later, she studied in Clermont-Ferrand um, in France and received a PhD um, in law in Rome in Italy. In 1934, she returned to Krakow University, made a master in philosophy, and then she fled the Soviet occupation in fall 1939 to France. After the German invasion in May 1940, she fled to Britain with her husband. And in January 1940, um, the Refugee Committee and the Alumni Association of, at Queen's University received the permission to assist a refugee scholar and selected her um, in August. In January 1941, Queen's Journal reported the long expected arrival of, um, and I quote, Madame Christina Spiranska, Polish refugee scholar. At Queen's, uh, Spiranska gave talks about um, the necessity um, of increased aid for Britain. She worked on a study um, of Canadian civilization published um, on Polish literature and conducted research on French and um, Franco-Canadian literature. She left Queen's University by the end of 1942. And the Refugee Committee supported at this time five more scholars, um, uh, for example, from Czechoslovakia, uh, Hungary, and the Netherlands. In 1943, uh, Spiranska was the curator of the exhibition Poland's Past and Present in the Red Path Library at McGill um, in Montreal. After being employed at the Toronto Public Library in 1945, she left Canada and became a librarian at the Cathedral College in New York. And um, we brought this, or we um, decided to take this doorknob here um, as a representative um, for her privacy, the privacy she got back when she arrived um, here um, in Kingston, because uh, she took uh, she took residence in Bun uh, White Hall. And um, this was probably after um, this uh, journey for the first time, uh, a private room uh, she if, uh, could uh, have only for herself. Uh, going back to our main exhibition, the Queen's Refuge um, exhibition, um, we have the third um, main part um, entitled a Relief. So, um, and this is kind of um, related to both examples I've talked about before, to Bader uh, and to uh, Spiranska, um, who um, had some kind of 
help and organization on the other side, on uh, the university side and within the com uh, uh, community. So the response um, to refugees um, varied at Queens at different times. Uh, silence, ignorance, and even hatred are therefore also part of this story. However, some examples from the university's history show um, also activism, creativity, and the meaning of personal um, experience. And I brought you two examples um, from this perspective and from this section of our um, uh, exhibition. And one um, is uh, Andre Jos Bieler, while not a refugee himself, uh, Bieler ha had a significant impact on refugee relief efforts in Kingston, as well as at Queen's University. Um, born in Lausanne in, in, in Switzerland, his family moved to Montreal when he was 12. Um, after serving in World War uh, I, he studied art um, in Paris, New York, and Switzerland, and lived in Quebec from 1927 on. In 1936, Bieler became artist in residence at Queen's University and taught as a professor of art until his um, retirement in 1964, at which time he also received an honorary degree of laws from the university. From 1957 to uh, 68, Bieler was the founding director of the Agnes Etherington Art Center and the first president of the Federation of Canadian Artists founded in 1941. In October 1940, the Ottawa branch of the Canadian National Refugee um, Committee organized an exhibition with an auction to raise money for relief um, work. The variety um, of artists, uh, a variety of artists donated their artworks with Bieler contributing an, uh, an oil painting um, entitled The Sunny Market and a pencil drawing. While this exhibition was important for Canadian art in general, um, it also points to the variety and creativity uh, of relief efforts that um, the Queen's community was involved in at this, at this time, ranging from fellowships and accommodation, like in Shibranska's case, um, to uh, the quilts for refugee children that the Levana Society collected in 1941. This exhibition and auction in 1940 also points to the network beyond the university and Kingston that Bieler was part of. Alongside religious and uh, other organizations, the Canadian National Committee on Refugees, I've mentioned before, um, the committee that organized this um, exhibition and uh, auction in Ottawa, played an important role in um, relief efforts in general. Uh, from 1938 to uh, 1948, the committee was chaired by Karine Wilson, who received an honorary degree of laws from Queens in 1943. In October 1941, she was in contact with the Dean of Medicine, uh, Frederick Arrington, husband of Agnes Etherington, and advocated for more uh, refugee medical men and foreign physicians. But Etherington could only report, um, and I quote him, a hopeless minority in favor at um, a vote of the Medical Council of Canada. Local or individual openness toward refugees uh, relief efforts which Andre Bilon represented at the same time as general disapproval inspired by prejudice or immigration law illustrate a simultaneity um, apparent in other periods and refugee contexts too. The second example um, in this relief part um, I brought for you is um, Mustafa, uh, Mustafa Sahir. He was born in Kabul, um, Afghanistan in uh, 1964 as the grandson of uh, the former Afghan king, Muhammad Sahir Shah. Sahir Shah was exiled from Afghanistan in 1973 in a palace coup. Um, so Sahir had to leave with him uh, at, nine, at nine years old. The forced move led to uh, much turmoil in both um, Afghanistan and um, Sahir's life uh, as well. He moved to many different cities, um, so to Rome, Vienna, London, um, before continuing his education here at Queen's University in 1987. In Kingston, Sahir became active as a co-founder of the Afghan medical relief organization, the AMRO, in the late 1980s. As of uh, 2002, the organization had sent medical supplies and other relief um, to Afghanistan 
uh, to a value of uh, estimated uh, $250,000. Uh, AMRO also brought 15 wounded, ma mainly young Afghans, to Kingston for medical treatment of wounds from the Soviet-Afghan war. Um, and in a 2003 uh, newspaper article, um, Sahir mentioned that AMRO was, um, I quote him, only permitted by the government to bring them in, treat them, and send them back. Such relief work was, of course, only possible with the help of people um, uh, from Kingston and beyond campus. Before returning to Afghanistan, after the fall of the um, Taliban in the early two 2000s, uh, Mustafa uh, Sahir uh, served as um, his grandfather's um, diplomatic assistants, became later on uh, the former king's chief of staff um, until he was chosen um, the ambassador to Italy in 2002. Um, and he served in that role until becoming um, the director general of Afghanistan's National Environmental uh, Protection Agency in 2005. As the current Taliban take over uh, of the city of Kabul and uh, Afghanistan, it is unknown whether there will be a federal ministry um, of the environment. As a result of this uncertainty, many climate officials are um, in hiding at the moment, and Sahir's uh, fate um, was was and still is unknown until today, um, until uh, the finalization of our exhibition and uh, until the finalization of the manuscript for this talk. Um, but he may have unfortunately become a refugee again because um, of this new movement and um, new development um, in Afghanistan. The last section um, we entitled uh, Arrival. Um, not unlike uh, other uh, migrants, refugees are confronted um, with new environments um, affected by factors such as weather conditions, but also social and economic constraints. Individuals and the community play a significant uh, role in helping refugee, refugees to adapt and even to arrive um, again, whatever this term means in the individual case. Um, I brought you again two examples for uh, this last uh, section. Um, the first one is Klepp Grotkov. Um, so he was born in Moscow and lived with his family in uh, southern uh, Russia after the revolution. Uh, he fought in the White Russian Navy and fled in uh, 1920 uh, via Tunis to, and Marseille to Prague, Czechoslovakia. After his studies and a Bachelor of Science degree, uh, Grotkov immigrated to Canada and worked for two years on, on a farm. He continued his studies and earned a PhD in 1934 at the University of Toronto, after which he was immediately hired by the Department of Biology at Queen's University as a lecturer and specialist in plant psychology. At Queen's, in 1948, Krotkov established um, the first radioisotope um, laboratory for biological work in Canada, which um, utilized um, uh, isotopes to study uh, to study intermediary uh, metabolism uh, in plants. Grotkov became uh, the uh, Samuel McLaughlin Research Professor um, of Biology here at Queen's in 1954, uh, was a member of the Royal Society of Canada and awarded the Flavel Medal in 1964. As early as January 1933, Krotkov gave a talk um, to the Levana Society uh, here at Queen's about his experience and the, um, I quote him, the friendliness of the Canadians towards um, foreigners. However, Kingston and the university provided um, him not only uh, with a job opportunity, um, Grotkov's childhood uh, friend, uh, Valya, uh, fled the revolution as well and followed him to Canada, where they were eventually married. Uh, Valya Krotkov taught mathematics and astronomy at Queen's and helped to start the Department of Russian. He, her obituary in the alumni review from May 1998 mentioned that both of them were, and I quote, always thankful to this Canadian city and university, which so warmly, warmly helped them to build a new life. And I brought you a second example. This is um, uh, the example of uh, Hans Eichner. Um, he was uh, the son of a Jewish family from uh, Vienna in Austria. 
after the Kristallnacht um, uh, pro pogrom in fall uh, 1938, he fled with the help of um, the Jewish aid committee um, to Belgium and later to England, um, interned as an enemy alien in 1940, so similar to, um, to Bader. Eichner was sent to Australia, not to Canada, and started studying in an internment camp. After the war, he was a student of German studies at the University of London in England, where he earned his PhD shortly after. In 1950, um, uh, and, and shortly after, in 1950, he started as a German lecturer here at Queen's University, where he immediately uh, fell in love with the landscape. Eichner left uh, Kingston in 1967 to um, became the chair of German of the German Studies Department um, at the University of Toronto. This book you can see here for German writers from 1964 illustrates the ambivalence um, of his arrival. Persecuted by German-speaking Nazis, he built his career on this language that was his own. He became a well-known specialist and translator of the philosopher Friedrich um, uh, Schlegel and the scholar of Thomas Mann. The latter was the focus um, of Eigner's PhD thesis and is uh, one of the four German writers introduced in his um, lecture, radio lectures in winter 1963-1964 uh, uh, documented in this book. But Mann, Thomas Mann, also had the simi a similar fate um, to Eichner, the Democrat and novelist fled Nazi Germany already in 1933. And the same is true for communist dramatist uh, Bertolt Brecht. Um, you already know him from the quotation um, in the first part of my lecture. Um, and Brecht was introduced by Eichner in this volume and in his uh, radio broadcast um, as well. This intersection of language and culture remained um, the focus of uh, this Germanist, um, not only in his research and teaching at Queens. In 1957, for example, Eichner um, read um, poetry by Rainer Maria Rilke at the German club on campus, um, another author introduced by him in this book. So shortly and shortly before his death, um, Eigner's semi-autobiographical novel Kahn and Engelmann uh, was published in 2000, uh, 2000 first in German, addressing his family history, Jewish identity, and uh, the Holocaust. And um, this book shows in particular the fragility of a term like arrival and how long the process of arriving can take um, for refugees. The last uh, section uh, of our um, exhibition, so or our exhibition ends open, uh, begins with a question and it, it ends with a question, um, and it ends with, with the question, what's a refuge? And um, this question concludes um, the exhibition pointing uh, by pointing to the agency of refugees and um, who is allowed or even able to speak. Um, but this question, question also addresses um, the visitors, us, ourselves, and um, our role in recent uh, forced uh, migration processes around the globe. And I will not uh, read aloud um, the quotations. Um, you can see them here on the slide. Um, you will find them in our exhibition, of course, but also um, uh, in the online exhibition. But we, what we try to do here um, is both um, collecting the specific voices and uh, reflections of uh, refugees that are um, related to Queen's history, um, but open up um, this question also to the visitors. And um, so visitors can leave a note how they would uh, respond um, to uh, this question. And um, I'm looking forward to the new answers. Um, we will find out um, this Friday at the latest, um, the last um, day of, of, of opening um, of our exhibition. So um, finally, um, yeah, I will come to an end. Um, I, I don't, I don't have a, a real final, final thought, um, or maybe, uh, maybe I have two. And um, when, when we think about the history of um, uh, of refugees, I would say um, history matters. Um, this is true when we uh, think of the terminology we use today that always comes with a historical dimension uh, with a history itself. The same is true for any form of legislation, public debates or uh, representation in, 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 in the news. Second, um, since this is um, the annual archives lecture um, at Queen's, um, how do we organize our memory uh, for the next generations? Um, what are the voices of uh, 
or where are the voices of refugees um, preserved? How do institutions like uh, archives respond to processes that are considered irregular? processes and individuals not fitting into the, the emigration-immigration uh, dichotomy I've mentioned at the beginning of my talk, or processes behind a term like transit or arrival. I hope our exhibition and this talk um, provided you with some um, answers or at least triggered your thinking about such re uh, representations and how we respond um, to them today. Thank you for your attention. Well, hello, everyone. I want to just uh, take this opportunity to say thank you very much to Sven, um, not just for the interesting talk, but for the interesting project uh, all around, right? The exhibition, your enthusiasm for archival sort of research from the moment we met when you brought in your first class, you know, has warmed my temperature and humidity controlled heart, uh, archival heart. It's been a real pleasure sort of working, you know, because as much as this project has been about the exhibit, I would say that's also been grounded in teaching, you know, with the students. The students were always actually, which it was really lovely to, to see, um, and sort of that engagement, um, your inclusion of students, uh, every you know, step of the way that and start and fit and start of this through COVID. <laughs> um, and also their enthusiasm to participate through fits and starts, a year delay, uh, this, you know, uh, I think actually speaks, you know, really well. And I would also say that it was, as the first part of your talk, talk it wasn't just the students as an archivist. It was really interesting to think often when people come to the archives and say, I'm interested in immigration. We're like, well, here are the ship's passenger lists. And that is, you know, sort of, but what you were saying in that first part of very, that of thinking about immigration, emigration, what is a refugee? What is a refugee? All of those things actually, for me, you know, had us look, had me look at our material in a really, you know, sort of more uh, expansive way. Um, and you were also using, you know, the faculty record uh, and and university institutional record in a way that, um, again, we, you know, faculty record is often this betwixt in between kind of record. It's about the institution and their pedagogy and their teaching, but you sort of also from that looked at the personal. And we don't often have. So it was a really wonderful way to see those records being used and how to see that institutional record being used as well. Um, I thought was really, you know, sort of it was a great experience for us as well and a learning experience for us as well. So I just wanted to say thank you, not just for the talk, not just for the students, but also for having us examine our records uh, in, a, in another way. So yes, claps, thank you all around. And I think Ken has opened up uh, the chat uh, for any questions. So I will see, I cannot see. If, if, if you don't have a question at the moment, um, I, I, I just wanted, uh, thanks so much, um, Heather. And um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful, especially to you, because you did so much for this project. And uh, while learning, like I like the way you just described it, but I just wanted to to mention the students again. So um, this was pretty much important for me from the very beginning, and it was not the first um, exhibition project I organized with students. So I um, kind of uh, knew what will happen, and uh, it happened in, in in this case as well. So um, the students were just transfixed and um, they uh, dug out um, biographies and examples I didn't know before, nobody knew before. Um, so in this, this was, they did a real, no, not a contribution. Um, it, this is our exhibition and um, the students were simply part of this, um, um, of this project, um, doing this kind of research, delving into uh, entirely new topics, working with archival records with, uh, what, what I encouraged uh, students all the time in, in my professional career um, to go um, to the archive, to the library, um, work with the um, what is 
what history has left <laughs> left behind um, uh, and uh, you know the, develop an, a question try to answer it um, so um, again uh, it was really great to see the, the students and uh, just a, a second remark I, um, I I said this in my talk as well of course um, the last year wasn't helpful <laughs> at all um, I mean uh, we were planning in real exhibition then we thought okay maybe it's an online exhibition and then at the beginning of this year a real exhibition was possible again and still uh, it was uncertain in July or something um, so this <laughs> has been a very a very interesting project and experience from very different perspectives <laughs> yeah well and I do see we have a question actually from Rebecca which I'll just mm -hmm. Read, and she's saying thank you uh, for a wonderful talk uh, to to all of us. Um, but she wondered if you could speak about how working with material objects, thinking of the suitcase and about mm -hmm. for the shirt, informed your understanding of the history of migration. That's a wonderful question. I mean, um, this this exhibition already comes with this kind of material dimension. So it was. Uh, from the very beginning, when I started planning this and and uh, uh, organizing this together with the students, uh, we were planning a three-dimensional um, thing <laughs> exhibition. We had the showcases um, in the in the Jordan Library, uh, and it became became quite clear uh, early on that we cannot just exhibit a document or many documents uh, and many books um, because this is. It's, this is just boring. This is not a, not, not a nice exhibition. Um, so that's why um, this was kind of the creative part and sometimes also um, uh, took us uh, a lot of creativity to translate specific um, forced migration experiences into an object um, when we didn't have uh, an individual personal object like the Beta Shrub. The Beta Shrub is um, a very unique um, uh, object we have in this exhibition. The, the suitcase as well so we have um this kind of objects and in many cases we, have, we didn't have them um my own, uh, about my own thinking what uh, what i didn't mention or um I gave a brief overview at the at the beginning about um, uh, migration uh, research, and um, I mentioned this term uh, mobility. And um, when you look into mobility studies um, that emerged, I would say in the last ten years or uh, five years or so, um, they um, take a, a much broader look on uh, people. Uh, on the move, um, short distance, long distance, and so on. And what they take into account, and uh, uh, I would say traditional migration re research didn't do so, um, they take, for example, um, ships, planes, um, the specific locations, harbors, airports, um, but also luggage. Um, and how luggage is uh, transported and uh, in what kind of um, situations um, people could brought belonging and bring belongings and in other cases uh, not and um, so it's it's not so much this exhibition and working with this uh, material objects it's, it's more this uh, more recent approaches from mobility studies and um, that make me think of um, uh, the, the meaning of material um, sources um, in migration processes because this, this is um, very often this is something something we simply do not know about. So um, we know um, when, when you look into uh, the older migration history, also here in Canada, for example, and it's, it's the same in Europe, um, 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 they mainly look on specific groups um, and they mainly look uh, on the uh, period after arrival. And we don't learn much about what, what happens between start and arrival, and uh, what kind of, I don't know, uh, transportation measures were, were involved, how um, uh, this kind of ship routes or um, uh, connections via plane, um, uh, how they uh, influenced, for example, the specific migration route itself. This is what mobility studies do as well. And that's why um, uh, I, I, I really like that. Um, uh, this kind, this kind of broader focus, uh, because this also broadens our sense what migration individually means and what uh, personal belongings sometimes mean and sometimes they do not mean much. Uh, so yeah, this is how I would respond to this. Thanks, thanks, for, uh, Rebecca. Wonderful question. Yeah.
Well, and I just thinking of that, the the Bader shirt, and I mean, even the ones where it isn't, I mean, I think it's telling that we don't have something, right? That there wasn't anything that was sort of left behind in mm -hmm. their, their time at Queens or going through Queens. And so picking those objects, right, for what it meant, um, I think is yeah. really good. Like the doorknob again, like for Bain Ray and like that sort of thing. But thinking about sort of that, the materiality of those things that are actually, that did belong to some people. I, again, I go back, we, you know, had that, uh, when we talked about the the Bader shirt uh, last week, but the idea that you know it still survives for so long <laughs> but, you know, uh, is kind of mm -hmm. also you know something that imbues it in right. some kind of way. There is uh, the material, but uh, that it is um, the, 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 again the the Bader shirt is a fascinating ob object. Um, this uh, turning the uh, the outside to the inside and still wearing um, this dot on the inside being still the outsider <laughs> um, but uh, the invisible outsider uh, as it, it is it's, it's it's really fascinating but uh, but i wanted to underline um what, what what you just said heather um that it's still there um this also tells us something so it obviously had a meaning um long time after uh, after internment and long time after um this uh, in betweenness in transit situation um being at queens leaving canada um even then it had obviously a meaning that's why we have it that's why it's preserved um and um this is re really an interesting um object and a very interesting story And I think there's, we'll do this maybe as the, what time is it? It's 4.27 um, as the, maybe one of the last questions. Um, it's from Ken, actually, just uh, <laughs> in some ways, this ex exhibit is the first pass at a history of refugees at Queens. Um, and what surprised you about researching refugees when you came to Queens? You know, did anything challenge your conceptions or preconceptions about Queens or Canada or refugees uh, in general? Um... <laughs> there were a lot of new things I've learned, for sure. Um, I mean, um, I didn't know much about, uh, in general, immigration um, history and um, the settler colonial part um, that came before. And uh, it was from very early on, it was quite clear to me that we have to, to tell the story, um, this forced migration focused story from the very beginning on. This is where I already learned a lot. Um, what surprised me uh, was this huge group of, of missionaries that were active in the Mediterranean. Um, so Kingston was obviously a, a kind of a center uh, for this very specific Christian group that reached out and then in the like in the case of Annie Gordon became refugees themselves, um, but were also active in refugee relief at the very same time in this region and then moved back to um, uh, to Kingston, so I, I think this this is a group I I uh, I didn't see so much before. Um, of course, because of my own research, I was um, at the beginning pretty much focused on the 1930s and 40s. Um, I was first, of course, looking for um, uh, refugees fleeing Nazi persecution um, in. Germany, Austria, um, or um, uh, later on in, in, in Europe. Um, so I learned, I also learned a lot about um, uh, refugee um, and immigration um, policies over this long spent um, uh, period of time we are covering um, in uh, this exhibition. So this is how I would, uh, again, I've, I've learned so much, <laughs> especially from the students. <laughs> Okay, hey, well, then I please everyone join me in a round of applause uh, for Sven and thank him for being our lecturer this year. And yes, and this will be recorded and available online within, I think, well, Ken can probably speak to that more than I can uh, soon, maybe even immediately. Uh, so it can also be used. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm thinking that it is a good, you know, basis, as you said, when you first came here, there wasn't and, and the, the, the baseline has been struck, you know, and, and been presented and hopefully more work gets done and developed from here. Yeah. So thanks, everybody. And thanks uh, for having me. No, thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.
everyone. Thanks for attending and we'll see you next year.